More news and more mechanics. Today we're going to be covering Kislev, going through a lot of the cool mechanics that Kislev is going to have access to. What's really important and awesome about this is that we're going to finally get a idea of how Kislev is going to play in the campaign map. Now this doesn't really go into any of the battle mechanics. In fact, um, the previous Zinch and uh, um, Cafe mechanic videos, we really don't know what those battle mechanics are going to look like um, until we really kind of dive into getting some hands on with those uh, factions. Kislev, we have a rough idea of what they're going to be like on the uh, camp or battle map because we've played them already, right? But we still don't know a whole ton of stuff that's going to be uh, um, linked to that. But either here nor there, we're talking about campaign today. And in this video, we'll be talking about the technology of Kislev. We'll be talking about the motherland mechanic and the ice court mechanic. And also another one that's really interesting that kind of goes off of the way the settlement structure is going to be working for Kislev, as it seems to be quite different. So um, stay tuned. We're going to have a lot of fun jumping through this whole entire thing. If you have not yet pre-ordered um, Total War Warhammer 3, as always, guys, you can use the link in my description to my Nexus store. It's a great way to support the channel, and you get keys directly from the developer. Also, if you are enjoying this type of content, don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. Like I've always said, that helps a ton. Let's dive in here now on the mechanics of the Kislev campaign. And the, the a lot of what we're going to go through here is is pretty interesting because it's going to start off here with devotion and devotion is essentially the currency that Kislev generates and as we've seen so far with the previous two faction mechanic reveals everyone gets this unique currency that they're going to use for technologies for all, all their other mechanics everything like that it seems to be the blueprint going forward so i would expect to see this now in corn slanesh and nurgle when we eventually get those mechanic reveals sometime down the line so the way devotion works is it's pretty straightforward. It's generated from a number of uh, buildings. It can be, de de uh, I'm sorry, generated from other things. But the two big things that it mentions here is it's generated when you defeat chaos aligned armies and you can sacrifice the captives to give you some post battle um, additional uh, chunk of devotion. So it's cool to see that we'll see that as a post battle um, option, right? Like we've seen for the dwarfs getting an update and them getting the ability to access their rune gold or, or the, the special dwarf gold currency they get that in uh, as a post battle option now so it's cool to see that uh hit into kisla but that opens us up here with just talking about devotion like i said this is the currency for kislev and as you would assume you'd get it's um generated by a lot of the standard fare but it does say that committing any kind of heretical acts will cost you devotion and if your devotion dips too low chaos armies um, attack your homeland so it makes it sound like they will just straight up manifest similar to like say like a rebel faction that comes out of nowhere like okay there's a chaos incursion it just pops up in your lands and they're just going to go hog wild on one of your locations so pretty interesting how devotion works and not just simply a currency but also a mechanic in and of itself where if your devotion dips too low you're going to face some penalties for it Moving into our first actual mechanic here, we have the Motherland. And this is really where the primary use of Devotion is. It even just says it right there. And you're going to use Devotion to enact one of four uh, rituals or invocations, as you'll see in a little bit. And you invoke the god Salyak, which is the god of healing and comfort, a teacher of common sense, but cannot bring back the dead. This increases growth and replenishment rate faction-wide. And it seems to be that there is, it lasts for 10 turns. Um, I don't know what the, um, not recast, but the recycle is on this. Might be another, an additional 10 turns. And the important thing here, and you're going to see when we jump into the next section, we, when we actually bring up the motherland, um, picture the motherland uh, actual mechanic uh, pain it talks about supporters and each one of these seem to generate supporters based off of specific actions so saliak for example you'll get one supporter gain when uh, gaining a character rank so leveling up a character there you go it's all about growth and increasing um, your infrastructure faction wide it seems like then we've got Daz, the god of fire and the sun, legendary for giving knowledge of fire to ancient war human war chiefs. Increases income from trade and all buildings. So I bet you you'll gain a supporter whenever you probably like increase a main capital building. Or um, maybe if you do like a trade agreement or something like that. It probably has something to do with commerce. 
Ursin, god of bears and seen as the shepherd and protector of Kislev, causes attrition to all enemies in your lands and provides a unique army ability that puts a powerful hex on a target area. And this probably uh, extends to, you know, support or gained if you kill an enemy character or something like that. I, I could see that kind of being linked to it. And then Tor, god of thunder and lightning and a mighty warrior who cracks the sky. Is that a reference to a Mastodon album? Because I love Mastodon. But it gives all armies additional melee attack and bestows a unique army ability to massively increase damage potential in an area for a time. So maybe actually Urson is defensive. Like if you win a siege or any defensive battle, then you'll get like a supporter. Versus Tor, maybe you have to kill an actual uh, character or hero or lord and then you get a supporter. And we'll, we'll talk about how supporters are important in just a little bit. But each one of these kind of causes a great winter to whip across Kislev lands, spread snow across any battle in their any battles in their lands, and dissuading attacks from enemies. Should your devotion be enough, you can switch between or continue the effect at will. These great storms and rituals also serve to incite the populace to support your faction, which brings us to the next mechanic, supporters and the spiritual conflict for Kislev. So here you can see now the actual picture I was talking about and this is where we're going to be using a lot of devotion you can see the little icon for devotion that little um orthodox looking church with the the onion dome and the little aura over it next to salyak ursin daz and tor then you can see supporter actions now the way that this works is you've got two gauges and this is like direct that gauge is directly ripped from the priam sun mechanic of total war troy where um not Troy, that's it's a location, uh, where Hector and Paris are vying for um, Priam's basically blessing to be the next ruler of Troy. It's the same thing here, right? It talks about the Red Tsar, um, Boris Ursus. He's now dead, and this is for rulership, the, the um, overall, um, well, spiritual head, or the, the, the overall um, rulership, I'll just go with that, of... Um, Kislev. And what's the schism here is between Tsarina Katerine, who leads the Ice Court, that's her faction's name, and then Supreme Patriarch Kosteltian, who, reached, who uh, leads the Great Orthodoxy. So both of these are going to be vying for control of Kislev. And whoever becomes the actual rightful leader takes control. And it's pretty interesting here. So it says, should the vast majority of Kislevite choose one side of the other, it will become dominant, confederate their opponents, and reign supreme. Of course, both factions are more than willing to spend gold or devotion to smear their opponents. So again, just like the same mechanic Priam's Air from uh, Total War Troy, we're seeing that brought here. So you can use devotion to get some additional support or use coin, whatever it is. And we don't know, of course, how many supporters it takes to kind of uh, tip you up to the next level. You can see that the Great Orthodoxy has three and it barely has an effect on that uh, scale. It's, it's barely filling it up at all. So it's probably a substantial amount. I would probably say 50, 100, 150, 200, and then maybe like 500 or something like that at the end. Who knows? Um, but what I'm really curious about though, is how this will affect you if the if the AI beats you to it. And I never encountered that in Priam's Air where they beat me to it. So maybe some of you guys can comment and say, hey, yeah, that it happened to me and nothing really happened. So I wonder if the, the AI will always kind of like lag behind you. So this is a very interesting mechanic. And I wonder too about how it might work in a co-op campaign. Am I going to be vying for control over my, my friend's lands using the supporter mechanic? So a really cool one. Um, a little bit of a direct rip from Troy and not a bad thing, but I just wonder how the AI is going to deal with it and how or what happens if you beat out the or if the AI beats you out or if you're playing in a co-op campaign. So that is the new uh, Motherland invocations and supporters mechanic coming with Kislev. And like I said, too, you can see all those invocations at the top and what uh, the supporters generated one when gaining a character rank, so on and so forth. Now this next mechanic, Atomans, I almost said Ottomans, but Atomans and the great cities of Kislev is interesting. So basically these Atomans act as your um, governors of your locations. And I say locations because I'm not sure if it's going to be minor settlements or settlements or what the deal is. And we'll get to that in a little bit once we jump to the end of this section. But these Atomans will essentially lead and 
allow you to kind of give your province some bonuses, right? They can affect the income, growth, control, and corruption of the area. They also have various special effects and can develop more as their career continues. They do not earn XP like traditional lords, but will face various dilemmas to increase their skills. So that's kind of cool, right? Kind of an RP little flavorful mechanic, wherein you are basically coloring this Ataman's career throughout your campaign by having him deal with these dilemmas. You know, I really want Arangrad to be this, this strong trade hub, so I'm going to do as many commerce things as possible. Well, you know what? I really need um, Kislev to be on par with amazing military production. So my admin is going to be focusing on um, hero recruitment ranks, reduction to uh, 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 recruitment cost for units, whatever it is. So it'll be interesting to see what some of these bonuses are with the admins and what some of these dilemmas are going to be like if they're going to be a trade off like, hey, you're going to get a boon, but it's also going to have a penalty attached to it because like maybe, OK, you want to be better at. Uh, recruiting military units while well, you're going to suffer a penalty to growth or something like that. So I, I hope it's not too restrictive, you know, and because when it's too restrictive, you get into a, um, a kind of vicious cycle of always choosing a cookie cutter for your admins of, hey, Reddit or the forums have said this is the best possible path for this style, style of admin. Ignore the rest of it. It's just going to end up hindering you and so on and so forth. So I am curious. But the, the other thing, too, with this is the admin can actually be recalled or I'm sorry, brought up from actually ruling the province to become a general instead like in an emergency so he won't actually have the random combat traits of a lord but he'll just be able to come to the fore immediately you won't have to pay much he's already been recruited and everything like that but it says here you get one atom per two provinces you control however for while or however, while for some races and areas of the world that would represent a half dozen settlements or more the layout of Kislev is somewhat unique Three great cities dominate much of the landscape, Kislev, Prague, and Arangrad. It has been many moons since the three were united under one banner, but together they represent the nation. The geography of the area also leads to some other massive single settlements, such as the Skaven Hellpit to the north. Between these great areas are, are scores of smaller towns and villages, scratching out a living and funding the war efforts with men, farms, and weapons, which deserves the attention of your adamant is up to you. So again, I, I wonder how this is going to work. Um, are they just saying that, hey, there's not going to be a lot of major settlements in Kislev minus the three big boys with Kislev, Prague, and Arangrad, and the rest will be just kind of these little minor middling settlements with no huge big provincial capital. I wonder if that's how they're going to do things, or if each Kislev, it's like okay, Kislev, Prague, and Arangrad, there's your provincial capital of each one, and they will have something like three or four minor settlements attached to it, like having it be very large provinces in Kislev, but only having, I'm sorry, yeah, three total large provinces with a lot of little minor settlements in between. So again, I, I wonder how they're going to spice and, and, and kind of uh, uh, implement that into the game. Our next mechanic here is the ice court. And this one's pretty interesting. So the way that this works is, and just to kind of give you a nice little breakdown of it, here's a cool picture too. You can choose to recruit frost maiden heroes or ice witch lords. This strictly applies to these two types of characters. It doesn't apply to um, anything else. And of course, even the great orthodoxy has access to this. We don't know if there's any kind of penalty for it or something like that, but you can see that you've got two slots for one for each, two heroes, two lords, and you can unlock further as you go about. But essentially, you will take time. I think it looks like six turns to recruit one of these heroes or lords. And in that time, you're going to do some dilemmas that will help give passive bonuses to the character, as well as maybe color the skills that they come out with. Um, I, I don't know 100%. Who knows, too, if it's going to say, hey, if you can actually have a recruitment rank plus two, they'll stay in for two more turns and you'll do two more dilemmas that'll help determine things. But it seems like this is the process in which you can determine what trait is affixed to your hero and lord of the ice court without just kind of randomly waiting every day, every week for a new one to spawn to get the specific action you want or specific, I'm sorry, specific trait you want. So I'm wondering if this is how they're going to kind of curtail that and this is how you build into it. So you pay for the training and then you recruit the hero or lord at a reduced cost because you've already paid for their training. So it's an interesting little flavorful way that this is done, you know, before a kiss of spellcaster can be recruited, they must be sent to the ice court for training. Here, each candidate will have the opportunity to acquire a number of character traits. So they're going to come out of this with quite a few. I don't know if it's one per turn, like if there's six turn here, 
I'm sorry, I don't know if it's one per turn. It looks like there's six turns here on these ones. So we'll have to see if it's maybe one every other turn, so on and so forth. But it is pretty interesting to see how this is going to work out with the Ice Court. And it'll be interesting to see some very strong campaign heroes and lords because they'll have so many traits coming out of them. And our last subject is the tech tree, something that we've seen in the previous two videos that we're seeing here today with Kislev. And Kislev's got a very um, straightforward but also nicely unique style of um, tech tree here. And it's nice because you've got the land, which is the all-encompassing tech tree that every single portion of Kislev can pull from, right? And in here, you have to have two of the like if you're looking at the blah 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 if you're looking at this picture you have to get two of the top three then three of the four of the of the next one and then the last one you have all four before you can progress down each tier and what it says here is for kiss of their technology focuses on four key areas the land and three great cities each contains three groups of technologies, each of which requires a number from the group of four to unlock within a group several technologies may also be linked and you can't so uh, you see the land, you see Kislev, but there's also one for Prague and Erengrad, which we can't see. You can see there's a slider at the bottom. And you cannot, rec um, not recruit, you can't research any technology from Prague, Erengrad, or Kislev unless you own that actual city as part of your faction, which is really cool, right? So if I want really, really awesome, say, cannons, well, I'm going to need to go get Erengrad for that. Um, or maybe a, maybe Prague is going to help out with a lot of chaos, corruption, defense, and so on and so forth. So I really wonder how that's going to shake itself out. I mean, obviously, if I'm looking at Kislev here, we can see a lot of stuff like Ice Court indoctrination. That's probably going to definitely help you out. Probably reduce the time it takes to uh, bring a hero or a lord through the Ice Court. Uh, bear baiting on here, aggressive cultivation, Kislevian Ducat. Ducat? Like gold Ducat? Ducat is probably what that is. Orthodoxy interdiction. So improved empire relations so gospodar bloodline is interesting because that's the first time i've actually seen any reference to stuff like the gospodars even though we're we've talked about these um these governors right these these ottomans adamans and the adamans would be what i would assume the gospodar ruling class would have been so it's interesting to see where we kind of get a little semblance of them in the tech tree um, from a lore standpoint i would really like to know more about how all of the different Kislevite cultural groups kind of gets pushed into the actual campaign itself. And if there's any mechanics around that we just haven't heard about yet, or, or maybe each location has got that same, that, that cultural group, and that was going to make it a challenge to confederate them or bring them into your faction, whatever it is. But this covers pretty much everything for Kislev that we know so far, guys. Um, I'm really curious to see, again, more of this actual Kislev map and what it looks like on the campaign map. How are these provinces divided up? But I'm really excited, though, to play Kislev. I really want to get my hands on uh, Kislev because I, and when my, in my mind, Kislev was the faction I wanted to play the most in Total War Warhammer 3 prior to seeing and hearing about Cathay. And now I really want to play Cathay. Um, we still don't know much about what that pre-order race is going to be, whether it's going to be the Ogres. I think we all know it's going to be the Ogres at this point, or Chaos Dwarfs. But finding out more about that stuff here in the coming week, hopefully, will be pretty awesome. They did say that they're going to be covering the corn mechanics, so hopefully we'll be getting that this week as well. And we should have a Zinch roster reveal around the corner sometime soon, too. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Stay tuned for more news updates from Total War Warhammer. But I will also be dropping some videos here on Crusader Kings 3. Be on the lookout for some Age of Empires 4 coverage coming up when the game comes out the 28th. I will be going balls deep on that game and also some other Bannerlord coverage to come as well, guys. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.